Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Um, uh, thank you to friends at uh, RSIS and friends at Zico, and to all of you today for coming. It's um, uh, an honor to be back in, in Singapore. Uh, certainly, it's, it's been these last five days since I arrived uh, for this visit, an opportunity to sort of go back to my roots of uh, my first tours were in uh, Kuala Lumpur and in Jakarta, and all of my government activity was in, uh, in Asia. So Singapore being the hub that it is, uh, often came back through here and certainly in business now. Uh, I'm hearing some old names and uh, political characters and economic issues. It's, uh, it's always fun to catch up and I appreciate this opportunity. Uh, before I start on here, what I want to do is uh, again, give you just a sense of where I'm coming from. Uh, first, I'm not an economist, nor have I played one on TV. So please don't hold me to an economist presentation. Uh, what I want to give you are some thoughts on uh, this situation, born of uh, the 28 years I spent with CIA, all of it uh, in China, or all of it in Asia, most of it in, in China. Uh, subsequent work, the Minsk Group um, running Asia for the company and, and quite a number of corporate clients. And I also have the hat of uh, Vice Chair of the American Chamber of Commerce in China, where we've got about 1,000 companies, uh, 4,000 members, and we, of course, deal with a number of issues, good and bad, in dealing with the, the Chinese government and, and others as need be. So all of that experience is what's going into some of the thoughts that I want to present today. And I'm also not technically inclined, so if I screw this up, please excuse me. I think I just screwed this up. Thank you. I thought it was pressing the forward button, I guess. There we go. Um, what I want to, at the outset, I just want to give you some thoughts that were actually born out of a presentation from uh, some colleagues that are senior Chinese academics and uh, government officials and, and how they initially presented what uh, the One Belt, One Road initiative is. Obviously, you see the uh, picture of Xi Jinping, and uh, in the fall of 2013, he laid out this initiative while in, in uh, Kazakhstan and then later uh, coming to Southeast Asia, and it frankly caught the Chinese bureaucracy a little bit by surprise. There were obviously some folks who put this together, but uh, a number had to scramble and say, what is this? And basically then put the, the, the meat on the bones, so to speak, and that's what's been going on for the last couple of years. Uh, the officially stated mission for uh, this whole program, what China is saying is, that we want to carry forward and a lot of the same themes you're seeing in APAC and other form about win-win cooperation, mutual trust, uh, being able to have inclusiveness, mutual learning, etc. cetera, uh, and the norms of the 21st century. You know, high-minded, obviously very good goals and wanting to make sure that uh, this is presented in the best possible light and, and it is a yawning need throughout the region. Uh, again, some of the comments being made, which the, the first comments I have that really show how this is obviously a Xi Jinping uh, signature policy. And this is a theme I'll come back to often throughout the discussion of, he has put a lot of personal uh, gravitas on this whole initiative, which I'm sure all of you in this room and your understanding of China means that the entire party and bureaucracy have to rally around this thing and make this a success, which offers some opportunities. And that's also something we want to discuss. Uh, again, this one thing uh, what they want to do, and then some of the comments from Xi Jinping is to use the uh, China's assets from a rapidly expanding economy to really go into an area that is obviously has a yawning gap of investment, and to make this uh, really an avenue of, uh, in a more positive way, channeling the fruits of China's economic gains. Why now? Uh, this is. Again, th these comments here are, are not Randy Phillips speaking. This is actually coming from the Chinese explanation list that we have received briefings on in Beijing and, and beyond. Uh, the competition with TPP and TTIP uh, comes foremost to mind. And obviously, those of you who know about the RCEP initiative, that also has some of that in mind. But it's a, a mindset of we want to uh, put forth this whole initiative in a way that will be, at least in, in one sense, a competition for, a positive competition for those initiatives. 
to make sure that we're able to achieve objectives that are obviously beneficial to China, but also beneficial to the region. And so they've certainly had that back in mind. Then the excess capacity. Uh, you all know the situation with the Chinese economy, uh, particularly in uh, heavy industry, manufacturing, uh, many of the state-owned enterprise uh, industries and areas where uh, the significant overcapacity of steel, cement, uh, the kind of things that would go into a lot of infrastructure spending, they are grappling with how to deal with this. So this initiative certainly provides an outlet for that. Uh, and obviously you could boost China's image and uh, position the world to the so-called soft power argument. Uh, these next couple of bullets, again, coming from the Chinese side, is the, the strategic concern about the Straits of Malacca. And uh, I, this is the one piece that I was, uh, it certainly hit me upon hearing this, along with some other uh, uh, analysts and, and folks who follow this issue of, that, that's certainly true, but that speaks to obviously strategic and perhaps military uh, interests that are certainly at least are in the backdrop of this, this whole initiative. Uh, and when you see the map of certainly the Maritime Silk Road and you know the discussions in some years back of the so-called String of Pearls and the importance for the, the PLA Navy to protect its supply routes for China, that really comes into play. And then the last bullet there really is certainly uh, the Western provinces, uh, would certainly along the, uh, the Silk Road going to Central Asia, this is a way, this is, think of it as an updated version of the, uh, the Go West policy that uh, came out in, in a big way under Hu Jintao. Uh, this is just the next stage of that, and that's certainly an understandable thing. But then also the Northeast. Uh, right now, the way the China's economy is uh, suffering under some uh, real headwinds, uh, the serious headwinds in the Northeast, uh, the, the most laden with some of those traditional heavy industries. Uh, this is a way to try to basically throw some development funds at that direction. Now, just uh, sort of an overview on what this means for ASEAN. Obviously, I don't have to tell you in this room, you, it's a complex relationship. Uh, there's elements of cooperation and tension, certainly when you look at the South China Sea issue, uh, but obviously there's been a long time cooperation, long time economic and trade benefits. Uh, so it's finding a way to find the right balance, the most positive and productive balance to have this initiative be received and beneficial uh, and hopefully helping in some ways alleviate some of the, the tension that's at play. Uh, obviously there's opportunities for ASEAN economies, um, particularly in, in mainland ASEAN. Uh, there are huge uh, infrastructure needs. Uh, there already is a level of uh, Chinese investment that has gone in from significant uh, state players that uh, has, to some analysts, said that it's already turning into one economic zone in a sense. But that's clearly a, uh, an opportunity here. And you'll see in a bit in the, the map and some of the discussion of why uh, ASEAN is so key to this, the success of this initiative that it actually provides the L word the leverage word that you know, often use in business and in diplomacy that I think ASEAN has to remember. Uh, territorial disputes, it's rather, that's the tension piece that's out there. Certainly, you all know, see the news in recent weeks of uh, surface air missiles and radars and all that going in, and obviously the long-standing uh, uh, competing claims and uh, worries that we may be seeing sort of new proxy wars. Or, uh, I would, go so far as saying Cold War, but certainly tensions in the area. And that's obviously very close to home to ASEAN, and you worry about that, and everybody wants to know that this is manageable. Now, I, I have to always throw this slide in. You may, some of you may be thinking, well, this is kind of a weird juxtaposition in talking about China-ASEAN, uh, one belt, one road. But um, as a political backdrop, uh, the standard chart uh, after the 18th Party Congress of the Chinese leadership, the Standing Committee, and uh, the Politburo. The only thing that, I don't expect anybody to try to read this, but the thing to look at are the gray boxes under the names. Uh, those are people that according to the uh, standard operating procedures and rules of the Communist Party of China are due to retire at the end of this basically year and a half from now. Uh, 
there's five of the seven polyvirial standing committee members. So there's five seats in that seven seat body that are going to change over. Uh, every country has its politics. China certainly has its. Uh, you're hot and heavy into the China political cycle right now. Uh, there are knife fights going on uh, politically among factions, and pretty much it comes down to uh, Xi Jinping looking to replace uh, the folks from the Zhang faction. Uh, the Zhang faction is still very, very powerful, uh, much deeper and broader than, uh, than Hu Jintao was ever to, able to accomplish, and he needs to replace these people with people that will be supportive and, uh, and behind the kind of policies that he wants to pursue and is pursuing, and certainly this is key among them. There's that much personal, political neck on the line here that's going to be important who fills those slots. All right, back to One Belt, One Road. This is the, the map, which I'm sure many of you have seen, showing the land route and the sea route. Uh, the land route, i look at that, and uh, we'll get to this in a minute, but I often wonder what Putin and Moscow thinks about this, the traditional spheres of influence. Uh, that's got to be causing them a little bit of concern. And the sea route, uh, I, I find always interesting because uh, back in my government days and string of pearls and worried about you know, strategic sea routes and what the PLA Navy wants to do. I'm sure Admiral Wu Li had something to do with this map. Um, but look at the obvious strategic importance of ASEAN. ASEAN will make or break this initiative on the maritime side. And then obviously uh, India's got to be a little bit concerned. Uh, there's still the Sri Lanka emphasis. Uh, swing over to Africa, they have the, the token stop in Africa. Completely bypass the Middle East, which is great. Uh, similar to Xi Jinping recently going there, and uh, you know, it's basically keep it business, keep it business. Don't want to get in the middle of this this knife fight, and then head up to Venice. And you, you got to love the historical meeting point in Venice of both roads. Again, this is a centerpiece for Xi's economic and foreign policies. Uh, it's ambitious. Uh, and a lot of the commentary coming from Chinese interlocutors, they point out that this is much bigger than the Marshall Plan was, which is true. Uh, to, it intends to encompass 65 countries, 4.4 billion people, 63% uh, of the global population, 40% of global GDP, and 55% of the world's gross national product. Uh, obviously, uh, a lot. They're looking to boost trade up to about $2.5 trillion among this group. Uh, and so this is a very ambitious uh, initiative. Uh, we'll support it, obviously. I think you're already seeing this. Uh, we'll talk in a second about AIB, but also the new Silk Road initiative. That's basically $40 billion being put into uh, an initiative that is basically uh, to help private or so-called private investment. Uh, that's actually the avenue where you'll see more overt sort of for political and Chinese domestic policy goals, it's a whole lot easier and cleaner to go through that route to initiate pressure than it is through AIB. But that's, that's obviously a very significant amount of funding. And then AIB, obviously we've seen the, the rollout of AIB and uh, this is uh, by every indication being uh, really pursued uh, above uh, any kind of concern in a sense. Uh, Quality people, I think it's a it really has a, a, a real possibility of filling a need and showing in a very positive way China's desire to be a very active player on international finance overall. More than just infrastructure investment, this is where you've got it, it isn't you know, everybody talks about the finances involved, uh, which is obviously very important, the, the total dollar numbers. But it really is about a number of other things we're trying to pursue, whether it's uh, free trade agreements, communication initiatives, uh, media issues, um, you know, a lot of social uh, you know, harmonization, et cetera. So you'll, you'll see, and particularly coming back to how the Chinese bureaucracy works. And this kind of signature initiative, every single element of the Chinese bureaucracy is expected to rally around this and come up with their initiatives that will be one belt, one road tied. And so you're already seeing that. Yeah, obviously, the economic uh, gains in this whole thing for China. Now, you're, talking about, you're in a situation that Xi has described as the new normal. This is the, what you see in The Economist and The Wall Street Journal every day of 
Uh, we were falling, we were at uh, 6.9 last year. Uh, the goal of this year is 6.5, going to that new normal of slower but steadier growth, transition from a uh, investment to a consumption-led economy, and the recognition that, hey, we've got to uh, you know, find new ways in this new environment to uh, grow and utilize our economic power. Uh, the regional economic cooperation competitiveness this is coming back to the, the strategy of basically trying to make friends with your neighbors and make sure that you are playing a positive role and that will help your strategic interests in the region and that certainly plays into this. And the industrial overcapacity, I, I certainly from everything I see on the ground in Beijing from clients to the uh, AmCham side uh, plays out to that every day. It's, uh, you've got uh, some serious players on the state-owned side that are really hurting. And uh, that combined with the anti-corruption campaign and the slowing economy, you've got, uh, I wouldn't quite call it paralysis, but it's uh, decision-making is not robust right now in, the, in that sector. And this is hopefully a way to sort of break through a little bit of that. On the foreign policy side, uh, the, the, as Ross Perot once famously said in US politics, the giant sucking sound of the power of the renminbi is, is certainly at play. We saw it with the sign up for AIB. Look at the uh, folks understandably wanting across the, the region, wanting to be involved with this because it's obviously uh, when you've got that kind of money at play and opportunities to provide financing for initiatives that will be helpful to you, you want to go after it. And that certainly is at play. And utilizing that, uh, that incentive that's out there for folks to cooperate with China is, is certainly foremost in their minds. And then the soft power piece. It's uh, certainly in the region, certainly among the countries that are involved in this initiative, but also globally. Again, that piece of how China will be uh, a responsible player uh, in filling and, and pursuing a project that really is unprecedented, as well as being uh, a so-called responsible stakeholder in the system. Uh, AIIB, uh, uh, some of the facts on that capital base, uh, they're going in to, to start at $100 billion, uh, designed to promote infrastructure uh, among the Obor region. And the recipients, pretty much, obviously governments, businesses, it, 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 there's wide latitude in this. Uh, we recently, as a board in Beijing, had dinner with uh, Jim Lee Chun, uh, the head of AIB. And I don't know how many of you may have met him before. He is incredibly impressive. Um, there's, I think anybody who sits down with him is comes away impressed with uh, the gravitas that he has in the, the, the realm. Uh, and he would be successful in any one of our nations. Uh, he has insisted that if we were going to use this vehicle to pursue uh, something that is strictly to China's benefit, why would we go through all this hassle? And he's right. And again, even if you think the worst of things, there are a lot cleaner ways for China to pursue its interests outside of AIIB in this whole thing than via this means. So, again, one up. Uh, again, the, the investment targets, infrastructure and all, but it actually goes beyond infrastructure. It's in this realm of anything that can be seen to be aiding infrastructure will be something that they will look at for investments. Mm -hmm. The hole that we're in, um, even if you assume, and I, I believe that uh, the goals which seem achievable, ambitious but achievable the AIB has, uh, and the existing loans and activities of the Asian Development Bank, even if they achieve their full stated potential and goals, that's still going to leave a yawning gap in infrastructure needs. Uh, you see that the AIB is just basically starting up operations this year, looking at 1.5 to 2 billion this year, and then 10 to 15 billion annually after that. The, say, roughly 13 billion a year from ADB. Uh, maybe a slight increase on that, we'll see. And let's even throw in IMF, other World Bank institutions in this, let's say they get into the game a little bit. The annual infrastructure investment needs, according to ADB, is $750 billion. So again, not to be pessimistic about anything, it's just that the, the need is huge. I think everybody wouldn't be here if you weren't interested in this and, and know that, but this is still a relative small piece of the overall need. And uh, we have to keep that in mind as we consider this whole project. 
barriers, obviously, uh, again, folks look at the, the financing side of this, of where it's going, why, and all. Uh, there, there are obviously issues out there in, in a number of locations that are covered by this agreement where there's, frankly, a dearth of uh, quality projects to go after. Uh, there are challenging and economic and political environments to deal with. Uh, and obviously, that leads to compliance issues and other things that you have to worry about. So the, the challenge is big in terms of the finances, but it's also big in terms of quality of the, the investment and, and management of the projects. Now, this is a chart of the folks uh, that make up AIB at present. Uh, ASEAN is about 9%. Uh, China's basically, according to the bylaws, as written, at 26 percent and some people particularly uh, we could get into in the question area if you want about the u.s uh, policy towards aib and how stupid it was um, but uh yeah, folks looked at that and said well 26 percent you know right it's this bad so either just using this there you'll see in the structure of this there uh, are plenty of checks and balances on this and for folks to weigh in and the, the way the board is set up and clients, et cetera, that uh, it would be not impossible, but certainly more difficult here for any adverse uh, China-specific interest here to be played out. Uh, obviously, ASEAN countries were among the first to sign up for this, and it makes perfect sense. It's uh, uh, in the neighborhood, the needs are, are great, and uh, it makes sense. We do, good in terms of the relationship. Uh, obviously, eager desire for the, the infrastructure funding here. And collectively, you got 90% of the voting power. And again, I, I come back to the strategic leverage piece. 9% in any board uh, gets you at the table, gets your voice heard, but you, know, you don't, don't have anything coming close to veto power. But you've got strategic leverage in this. And it's all going to come down to how you define success in this. And Chinese leadership, Xi Jinping, needs this to be defined as success. Indonesia sitting on the board, that's great. Uh, uh, obviously, it will be something I would imagine that ASEAN countries will be talking amongst themselves how they, they make that structure work to uh, represent ASEAN wide views on that board, but I'm sure that will happen. And the brand is a leader you know, the region, the strategic goals here, uh, again, uh, using that financial power with uh, AIB and deepening cooperation, reshaping the, the international economic and, and financial governance system. That even if you think the most uh, least or the least benign explanation for this uh, that China look, is looking to move away from existing international financing structures and creating something of its own. Uh, everything that Jun and the team there has been saying, and every activity that you see, shows that uh, it, it wouldn't make sense for them to do that. And so I think that is overblown by a lot of people. Uh, this is Jilly Chun's comments. Uh, lean, clean, and green, hopefully not mean, uh, bank, and so we'll see how that plays out. Uh, the, again, the governance system we've got set up provides, you know, a, a, I think it stands up to any existing international organization in terms of its governance system and the ability to have some checks and balances. I mean, none of the system's perfect, this is likely not to be perfect, but uh, they are written into the bylaws. This $40 billion Silk Road Fund, if you want to watch where the thumb gets put down for domestic reasons, that's where it will play out. And it that's, makes a lot of sense. Potential for ASEAN development. Now, this is key. You saw that map. Uh, the, if you tie the financial and the strategic interests together, if ASEAN is not uh, successful and at the table and these projects not utilized, there's no way they could say that the Maritime Road has been a success. The, the thing I'd be a little bit concerned about here, in, in a sense, more from a bureaucratic sense, is that, again, the, uh, what has been happening up until now is that as each Chinese government entity has had to figure out, hey, uh, we got to make the boss, this is an important thing, we got to make this a success, uh, they need to score some wins up front. There, there's a, virtual hijacking going on right now of some existing organizations and uh, programs. And uh, this is where either existing projects that have gone on that could be described as infrastructure related that China's initiated, 
or certainly programs, and ASEAN has obviously been involved in a number of them, uh, they are claiming internally of this is, these are keys to what we're doing in One Belt, One Road. Again, if it turns out win-win, that's great, but I can see there'll be a little frustration with folks that have put those together within ASEAN and to see it played out this way. But again, uh, at the end of the day, if everybody gets what they want, uh, it could be a win-win. Uh, the, the development here, obviously, they, they, some of the things I talked about before, the uh, free flow of investment, the uh, China ASEAN free trade agreements are there. We're talking through RCEP right now and other initiatives. Uh, China is looking to uh, use these vehicles for uh, one belt, one road needs. But this obviously can help uh, as these projects go through, facilitate all these goals that I believe ASEAN shares. Uh, the, the maritime cooperation, the the investment capital, good services, all really hold potential to achieve some mutual goals. The growth and integration, uh, I know that it's always been a challenge, and it's part of what and I've talked to uh, some very smart folks this week about how things are going within ASEAN, about the, the, uh, the cohesion or lack thereof within ASEAN of uh, goals and initiatives and policies. Uh, it's always a challenge, everybody knows that'll be a challenge, but this if in fact successful in terms of the um, sheer amount of investment can only help that process one would think. And then the broader Asian region that uh, frankly ASEAN could be a launching pad for broader Asian activity and again if, if uh, coming back to the maps it makes sense that they, it, as Frank Sancho would say if they can't make it here they can't make it anywhere. Uh, they've got to, uh, it's got to work here. And potential risk, very quickly. Uh, a lot of these issues, many of you uh, know inherently, Beijing hasn't really managed a, a strategy with such scale before. Uh, that same could be said of the US when it did the Marshall Plan. Um, doesn't mean it can't be successful, it's just that it's very new and as I said at the outset, much of the Chinese bureaucracy had no idea what this uh, initiative was when it was announced. And they literally had to get together. MFA and NDRC came out with a joint strategy last year during the BOA conference in time for Xi Jinping's statement to basically say, hey, here's what we think it is. Uh, but they had no idea between 2013 and 2015 what that would be. So the bureaucracy is catching up. They're putting the, the people in place uh, to try to manage this in each bureaucracy. Uh, but it's going to be a work of progress. And so that's a risk. Difficulties in investing in infrastructure abroad. Think about, uh, particularly in Africa and in uh, some places in Latin America. A lot of the criticism that took place of zero enterprises and uh, infrastructure initiatives. Uh, things like non-use of local labor. Uh, sort of a, you know, accusations of an imperial attitude. That kind of thing. Uh, that may come up again in certain places. Again, we'll have to wait and see, but that's that's certainly a track record there that folks bring up. And the construction companies operating abroad, this is um, similar issues where you had projects that um, seemed to, to fall by the wayside and recently had the Bahamar and, uh, and the Caribbean and, and some others where uh, basically the negotiating begins after the project's already uh, underway and uh, you end up having a lot of frustrated parties and problems on all sides, and that kind of thing could potentially happen again. The geopolitical implications, uh, you know, again, you tie through the, the particularly the Maritime Silk Road and what that means uh, for uh, what the PLA Navy might be interested in, and particularly the, the Silk Road, uh, coming back to Putin's mindset on this. Uh, if Central Asia, which has always traditionally been a Russian sphere of influence, uh, if this goes beyond <coughs> pure economics, which Putin seems to have signed off on for the moment. Uh, if it seems like that, that uh, influence is building beyond that, you could see some tension going on with uh, Russia. And the strategic importance of the Russia-China strategic partnership uh, could be affected by that. Uh, some concluding comments on this. Uh, again, some of this is weighed in from uh, my colleagues in, uh, in China. Uh, obviously, this is a, a very important thing for Xi. Uh, I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, that system thrives on when 
particularly the leader ties himself to a particular policy or the party says it's going to achieve certain goals like uh, a doubling of GDP by 2020, uh, which means to get there from the time they started, they need to have at least 6.5% growth every year between now and 2020. You could bet the family farm that they will have 6.5% growth on paper every year between now and 2020. Otherwise, you know, the party doesn't win. And you gotta remember, a, a, an analyst on uh, looking at, at Chinese news media uh, sort of broke it down to how you look at, is there anybody here from CCTV by any chance? I don't want to offend anybody. <laughs> uh, if you look at any CCTV, CCTV news broadcast, going back decades, you'll get three things every night. You'll, you'll see the leaders are busy, and they'll show what the leaders are doing that day, and man, they look busy. They're out talking here or there, everything else. The people are happy. So you'll always see happy Chinese faces, wherever it might be. And there's chaos in any foreign land. So, um, so you know, somebody didn't shot the US or Syria or whatever it is. Those are the three messages that have got to be make up any news broadcast. So I'm not why, sure why I brought that up, but that's, um, <laughs> it, it's important that this is Xi Jinping's thing. Uh, multiple government agencies and SOEs have been mobilized in this. And I think some of you may have seen this already. There's already a significant scramble underway from a number of SOEs and entities in their current dealings across the region affected by this to say we need to make some progress on this and trying to recharacterize perhaps something that was already uh, in the works as one belt one road. That's fine, they get their own bureaucratic reasons to deal with. It gives you leverage in a sense to, to try to help recategorize that and use it to your advantage. The leadership again wants to see quick results on this but it's going to take decades. They, they realize that, but if you look at that political cycle coming back to the, the map, they've got their own political cycle, and you're talking the next five years, particularly the next two, there has to be some uh, guard markers there of progress. And so, therefore, you again have a little leverage up front to show that you're helping them achieve a goal that they have to prove upstairs that they're achieving. And the, the initiatives, are, they're Beijing saying that, I mean, it's going to be shared, it's going to be warmly welcomed, and all. They're, they're going to, there's, again, the political need to show that oh, everybody's wrapping themselves around this. This is great. The same way, coming back to the IIB, when the U.S. was stupid in the way in which it uh, responded to this, the corollary to that was, well, everybody else, they're pretty smart. They see the advantage of working together in this, and that's great. It provides leverage. Uh, the international reaction to this, um, they're still in, in, in uh, Beijing very focused on uh, not only results, but uh, in every senior official U.S. economic meeting in Beijing uh, and with the Japanese, mindful of U.S. and Japan's attitude on this. And uh, there's always kind of a, a thought that behind the scenes, the U.S. in particular is trying to somehow uh, shoot this thing down, sabotage it, doesn't want to see it succeed, uh, that you know, any force stuff, it's easy within the system to argue that any headwinds that they've got are being driven by that, and Japanese are close second to that. So we're watching very carefully what international reaction is this, the continued levels of support from ASEAN and beyond, uh, and then seeing uh, how this all plays out. The key thing here, though, is that it will have this whole program, and I'll leave you with this, uh, is a huge opportunity, but it's also one that uh, guaranteed geopolitics are gonna play a role throughout this whole thing. And it's certainly gonna be seen through that lens in Beijing as events more, whether it's, it should happen that way or not. But uh, I think you're gonna see that as we go forward in China's political cycle, and as that pressure builds, there's going to be even more pressure from Beijing to show that success on this. And once again, ASEAN is key to that. And with that, I'll, I'll stop there. And I look forward to the comments from our discussants and, and certainly the questions later on this afternoon. Thank you.